Professor Michael Crawford is a UK researcher and undisputed world expert on the omega-3 fatty acid, docosahexaenoic acid, commonly known as DHA. He has dedicated his entire professional career and more than 60 years of work to this topic and has proven the irreplaceable role of the marine food web containing DHA and other essential trace minerals in the cognitive evolution of our species. In this interview, we discuss the ancestral formation of the nervous system more than 600 billion years ago in the oceans, the difference in brain sizes between land-based and sea-based mammals, the role that DHA is playing in this process, what happens when humans are DHA deficient, and much, much more. We end on the exciting and optimistic idea of marine agriculture, which aims to foster growth of fish and seafood populations by cultivating reefs, seagrasses, and other marine habitats. This is possibly the most important podcast I've released on nutrition because of the profound consequences of DHA on the cognitive development of unborn babies. I hope this podcast provides an understanding of how critical this dietary factor and seafood is for your health. Michael Crawford, thank you for talking to me on the Regenerative Health Podcast. Okay, my pleasure. So you you are what I've called in the past the Pope of DHA. Uh, <laughs> because oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> your, your pedigree, your research pedigree, your experience about the, the fundamentals of this uh, highly important compound for human health uh, is, is unparalleled. So... Quickly, give us a, your your professional background and your cr- credentials, so people can understand how um, how deep your depth of knowledge is um, on, on this subject, and how long you've oh. been thinking about the problem. Well, <laughs> um, I did my um, doctorate at the postgraduate Royal Postgraduate Medical School, and then pushed off to Africa to help with the establishment of the uh, new hospital at Malago at St Macquarie College Medical school and uh, that opened my eyes to the importance of nutrition which i hadn't really thought about before and and when i, I came back to the united kingdom in when was it 1965 um all the rage was dietary fats and heart disease and things like that that was a big thing so when i was in africa i, I spent my time really looking at the non-communicable diseases and possibility of nutrition involvement in them and published quite a lot about that. So when I got back to London, the question was, I was given a brand new laboratory at the Nuffield Institute of Comparative Medicine then. And um, the question was, what do we do? Well, um, it was clear that fats were important, but everybody was working on cardiovascular disease and suddenly a sort of a spark came up where the brain's made of fat. So what about studying the brain? So that's how it all started. And are you a practicing clinician? Were you seeing patients as, as a medical doctor no, as no, well no. as research? I'm, I'm a pure scientist. Mm. I'm a chemical pathologist. But I am. I'm a fellow of the Royal College of Pathologists. Mm. And um, so, so give us a background of of what was happening at that time. You. So people had been focusing on heart disease, but someone had noticed that the brain is obviously very rich in in fats. So what was the state of the art in terms of the scientific knowledge when you started in this field? Well, pretty well none. Uh, Svenna Holm in, in Stockholm had published some data on the fatty acid composition of the brain, which was quite unusual. And... Um, uh, so, r- really, what occurred to me was the fact that the, the brain is made of fat, sixty percent fat, and the rest is 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 water, protein, and minerals and things like that. So, fat was really the important thing as far as the brain was concerned. And and what Svenerholm had identified was that there were essential fatty acids important in the brain. Um, so. The, having sort of seen in, in Africa nature's wonderful and great last experiment in mammalian evolution in all the different animals, the question that occurred to me was why is all these big animals and small animals and why is brain size so very variable from one species to the next? 
And so what we did was to uh, conduct a study on the brains of some 36 mammalian species. And the we looked at the liver as well, to look at the liver fats as well, to, to establish a relationship between the animal and its sort of background diet, so to speak. That's what the liver more or less represented. And, um, and the brains. And the interesting thing was that the, the liver fatty acids um, were just all over the place, all over the place. And uh, uh, ranging from 0.5% of the uh, uh, phospholipids right up to even 40% in, in, in one case. So um, that was strange, but the and, and was consistent with the sort of way that the animals behave from carnivores to herbivores and big and small animals and so on. However, the interesting thing was that whenever we looked at the brain, the composition was the same. It was pretty identical. I mean, it was give us to a few percent, but um, essentially the profile was consistent across 36 mammalian species. What was different in the species was, of course, the extent to which the brain had evolved, the size of the brain in relation to the body. And it suddenly struck me that we had a high proportions of docosahexaenoic acids in all 36 and uh, it, it was the question was where does this come from and could it be synthesized and when you looked at the herbivorous animals that ate a lot of of the precursors the, the parent fatty acids of both the omega-6 and the omega-3 two families of the essential fatty acids when you looked at the precursors, the precursors were all over the place. And what was interesting was that um, in the big, fast-growing animal, the amount of DHA in the liver was very tiny. Instead, the immediate precursor, which had only five double bonds, because of hexanoic acid, as its name implies, has six double bonds. Each double bond is interrupted by a methylene group. So the, the the question was, did the um were these animals why weren't these animals able to make DHA? And when you looked at small mammals like uh, rabbits, rats, hyraxes, and so on, they had lots of DHA and had a squirrel has actually <laughs> a bigger brain relative to its brains body size compared to us, it has about 2.5%, and we're sort of knocking it's about 1.9%. So, um, but when you get up into these big animals like rhinoceros or something, it's smaller than 0.1%. And so it occurred to us that actually what was going on was that the velocity of body growth was outstripping the ability of the animals to make DHA from the parent precursors. So what we did to test this was to look at the, uh, let me backtrack, what it really meant was that the ability to synthesize DHA was pretty well rate limited. And so what Andrew Sinclair and I did was to use a double labeled experiments in which we took um, a tritium labeled and carbon 14 labeled uh, alpha linolenic acid as a precursor and DHA separately labeled and fed them both together to rat pups, popping it into their mouth so it went into their stomachs. And then we looked at the brains. And what we saw was that the preformed isotope for DHA, the preformed isotope, was uh, incorporated into the growing brain of the rat pup at an order of magnitude greater efficiency than it was for the synthesis from the precursor alpha-linolenic acid. So that effectively showed why these big, large mammals with fast-growing bodies, they got all, the rhinoceros um, achieves a one-ton body weight um, after four years of, of growth, uh, and it gets all the protein it needs for that huge velocity of body growth. 
from the simplest food on the planet, namely grass. So protein was not the problem. But the facts obviously were. The facts quite very clearly that these essential fats and glucosahexaenoic acid in particular was a limiting factor so far as brain growth and health was concerned. So that's how it all started. Let's keep pulling on that um, that very fascinating thread uh, because uh, I think this is the crux of of your work and the clinical implications of of DHA um, for human health. So what you are describing is that the our the brain the complexity of the brain or the size of the brain is going to be a function of how much preformed dha this this really important omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acid the yeah. organism can accumulate from its environment and which obviously means from its food web for the from the food yeah. environment that it that exists so so yeah. talk a bit more about these different um these different animals and perhaps their locations or their dietary habits as related to their, their brain growth. Right, right, right. right. Well, yeah, we, we, we studied all of the sort of um, land-based mammals like giraffes, zebras, hartebeestas, buffaloes, <laughs> things like that, so monkeys and some uh, hyraxes and baboons. We studied all those sorts of animals. And um, the point really was when you compared them with a marine mammal. Let's take a body size for body size. Let's take the dolphin and compare it with a lion. They're both carnivores. The lion has about, what, 350, 360 grams of brain or cranial capacity, if you like. The dolphin has 1.7. 1 1.7 compared to 340. That was a complete giveaway, uh, demonstrating the absolute importance of the marine food web in developing the brain. You have to understand, of course, it's, it's so logical because the brain evolved in the sea in the first place 500, 600 million years ago when it all started. And um, the only thing that it could use was, was marine nutrients. There's nothing else. There's no land or <laughs> very little to speak of. A lot more water than we have today, and um, and and, and uh, the formation of the brain, all down from the uh, we we studied all of this. Other people like Nicholas Bazan, Gene Anderson, and so on and so forth contributed to this. And um, we, we we if you take for example the cephalopods, they're, they're beginning. They have brains, eyes look very much like our eyes, and. Um, well, they date back to about 450 million years ago. The, the fish, the uh, amphibia, the reptiles, the mammals, the birds, and ourselves. We all basically have the same chemistry. It's absolutely astonishing. It's been conserved. DHA has been conserved in the signaling systems of the brain for over 500 million years. The implications of that seem to be pretty profound because it, it really implies that Mother Nature found something that worked and ran with that design specification and from that 600, 500 million year point uh, onwards. It, it it also implies that no matter um, you know, what what animal you are, you you need this this um, this key key fatty acid to develop. Yeah. Um, these higher order uh, cognition. So maybe for the for really to get down into the to the nitty gritty, what were the conditions of the the development of DHA? Maybe um, in these dinoflagellate organisms um, all that time ago. Well, what do you mean? Well, how did it all start? How did it all start? Well, basically, uh, uh, we have a theory about this, of course. Um, a lot of it is speculation because it, you can't go back 600 million years and, and, and study what's going on at the time. But we have a pretty good idea about what went on because the dinoflagellate is a little tiny single cell system, which has uh, been used actually in fermentation bats to, to extract the DHA from it. It's rich in DHA and 
interestingly enough, it has in its phospholipids um, a di DHA. So the phospholipids have two links to fatty acids in them. And usually the one in the middle, the SN2 position is so called, has a DHA in it, and the other one has a saturated fat. But there are molecules in the dinoflagellate which have two DHAs in them. This is most unusual. And you find it in your retina and my retina today. Now, we're talking about the, uh, something similar to the dinoflagellate that lived right at the beginning of the Vendian when we had uh, the transition from the prokaryotes to eukaryotes to the air breathing uh, animal systems. And it, what really is is most likely to have happened is that something, the dinoflagellate or something like the dinoflagellate was converting solar radiation to electricity. And that's really how it all started. Because that's what's going on in your eyeball. It's good. The, the, the whole photoreceptor system is converting effectively uh, photons into electricity. But it's not using DHA to do that. I'll come back to that in a minute. So going back to 600, 500 million years ago in, in the Vendium, when <clears throat> what would have happened is that DHA would have absorbed in the ultraviolet, and there was no ozone layer. So something like retinol, which we use for our photoreceptor, would have not worked at that. It would have been simply blown away by by um, the <coughs> strong ultraviolet. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so <coughs> what happened then was that um, we had. Excuse me, Rob. <coughs> a rabbit in my throat. Um, what happened then was that um, the ultraviolet radiation would be absorbed by an electron in DHA, which would be activated in the escape mode. So you then had these electrons, and they would run down the body of the animal and cause all the hairs to wiggle. And, you know, if you put your finger in an electric plug and switch, like, switch it on, yeah, you would jump. And, and so what we'd effectively have done would make the thing move. And where would it move? It moved towards the um, surface where the, the light was, and that's where the food was. So that's the vision of what it was happening right at the very early stage with powerful ultraviolet radiation zapping the planet. Now, uh, the next thing that would happen is that you started getting multicellular systems evolving. And as multicellular systems evolved with this electrical force, almost certainly that led to the evolution of a nervous system, which would lead to ultimately to the evolution of the brain. So that's how we we think it all started. And uh, the chemistry, the conservation of DHA in this or signaling system, um, is, uh, as I, uh, we have mentioned, is, is just going right down to that 600 million years. Uh, of course, when the ozone layer closed, then nature would have to find a different method for um trapping photons, and, and it obviously did with the system we have today with retinol, the 11 cis retinol that's attracting an electron. But DHA is still in there as it's a major component of the photoreceptor. It's still in there, and we believe it is transducing the energy from that uh, reception into an electron that then takes the message to the brain. And this is a, a really a, a quantum biological uh, effect and that is something that you've talked about in your recent papers and yeah. and so so maybe just explain that uh, that facet of the of this picture well yeah uh, it's, it's, it's it's interesting but um, <clears throat> george wall described all this retinal rhodopsin behavior in response to photoreception 
he, and he won the Nobel Prize for it. But in his speech, he says that anything that happened, all the things that he described in terms of proteins and GMPs, activation of um, iron movements and so on and so forth. What he said in his, his exception speech um, was that any of those events after the initial reception of a photon by 11 cis retinol, um, that's all far too slow to explain visual transduction. So we need an explanation of what happened next. And we've, we've actually published a, a plausible explanation as to how, how this worked involving DHA, because the astonishing thing is that DHA is a very high, uh, at a very high concentration in the photoreceptors in all eyeballs that have ever been studied. So what's it doing there? Uh, nobody really has got an answer, but we've published an answer. And the answer is this, that um, uh, when 11 cis retinol receives a, an electron, sorry, it receives a photon, uh, the, one of the electrons is activated with the energy. It absorbs the energy of the photon. So the energy of the photon is, if you like, inside this electron. And the electron is now... Um, energized into the escape mode. So we've got 11 cis retinol, it's a double bond. The en an electron escapes, so that leaves a single bond. Now, that's a problem. Uh, for some extraordinary reason, the system recaptures the electron and reforms the double bond. But as nature will uh, is, is sort of lazy, it likes to go into the lowest energy state, the, it goes into the trans situation. So you now have all trans retinal. And the, the um, point about this is that the trans formation, the trans energy of the trans double bond is significantly lower than the cis. So you now have a, a quantized package of energy, which involves the photon, number one, plus the energy of the cis-trans conversion. So where's that going to go? It's got to go somewhere. Otherwise, the retina will just heat up and, and, and so on. So the, so the idea is that there's a, a quite a lot of new evidence showing that the uh, energy transfer by by vibrations by heat and so on is 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 involved in photosynthesis so it's quite plausible that what in fact happens is that the energy from the cis trans conversion is actually absorbed by dha dha surrounds rhodopsin during the reformation of the um uh, photoreceptor, the photoreceptor disc, during the reformation of the photoreceptor disc, Nicholas Bazan has shown this, he said it, 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 the rhodopsin and DHA migrate together to form the new the new um, photoreceptor disc. So, so the cis retinol is buried in rhodopsin and DHA is surrounding rhodopsin. So it's in an ideal position to just absorb that energy. It's got to go somewhere. And so what we propose is that the absorption of that energy, actually what that means is that one of the pi electrons of DHA is energized. Now in photoreception, you get hyperpolarization of the membrane. With hyperpolarization of the membrane, that electron is going to be extracted. And then it's going to be sent to the brain, explaining George Wall's question, explaining the question that everything after the activation of rhodopsin is too slow, because an electron moving at electric speeds is plenty fast enough to um, uh, send the communication to the brain. Now, 
the, the interesting point about this is it not only sends the uh, information to the brain, but the information is being carried by an electron wave function. And this, the electrons are, uh, are funny things. They can be both particles and waves. And, and some, this is a well-established thing in quantum mechanics. And it, as a wave function, it has embedded in it the energy of the cis trans in the first place and the photon. Now, the cis trans energy is common to all photoreceptions. The difference is going to be the photon. Energy and wavelength are interconvertible. You can resist them. Well, they're mathematically related. So what that means is that this not not only explaining the speed that's required for transmission of the information, but also the energy is the wavelength. So it also explains how we see in color. So that that's what we've uh, written. That's uh, absolutely f fascinating um, and, and and quite incredible. The the question I guess I, I, I want to expand a bit more about, um, unless you wanted to add a bit bit more on the quantum on that topic, is the specific ways in which um life evolved once we got to the mammalian family. And um you we've all already delineated between the land based and the the ocean based animals and, and their brain sizes being a function of of the access to DHA. And the more DHA they had access to in the ocean, the larger their brains got. So um can you talk a little bit about these land based mammals and the fact that or, or the the fact that their brains um what what was limiting their brain size in was it simply just the um the abundance of DHA and the fact that they couldn't get it as is in as much abundance on the land compared to the ocean? Well, yeah, it's it's, it's um interesting question because the um the example of the dolphin is sort of repeated with a whole bunch of other marine mammals and um the <clears throat> the land based mammals, on the other hand, well, the little ones, the little ones and the birds, they can make plenty of DHA, as I said, but as as the body size, the velocity of, of protein deposition and body size goes, this rate limitation, which I told about, so the, the fact that DHA is, is a, a much more readily incorporated, means that, in fact, the conversion from alpha-linolenic acid is a very slow process, and many people have shown this. So, um, whereas they can make a little bit of DHA, they only can make a tiny little bit. And in fact, when we look at the um, chemistry of, of these animals, and the liver lipids and so on, what you see is that the immediate precursor for DHA, which is a cause pentaenoic acid, only got five double bonds, um, is pull, pulls up. The, you, you get quite a bit of that, but you only get a tiny bit of DHA. So the, the, this last step in the conversion of the uh, putting the last double bond into the, this conversion process is obviously, again, a very rate-limiting rate, rate business. So uh, all, all the way you, you look at it, it's, it's this slow business of making trying to make dha against a velocity of protein just deposition demanding lipids to make membranes but not getting enough time to make enough dha that's happening in all the land mammals which means that as so far as homo sapiens is concerned that um that we have to have access to the marine food web that doesn't exclude us having access to a land-based food web as well. And we've argued that actually we needed the best of both worlds. But the fact of the matter is that we certainly would have needed uh, access to the marine food web during encephalization. That's a fascinating way of framing it because it almost sounds like an arms race. There's a there's an arms race going on in the body to deposit a protein and fat and build this structure of of what the the body would be. But there's also a race to deposit um, and uh, accumulate enough DHA to um, encephalize or to to develop yeah. a very complex um, 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 cranium. So, 
so t- t- let's continue the story. And, and I think that's a great way of thinking about it. So we're say our ancestors were these land-based um, primates. Perhaps they were consuming uh, fruits. Perhaps they were consuming um, these seeds and nuts, perhaps. At, at what point um, do, do you see, from a timeline point of view, that things um, really shifted um, in terms of the formation of, of our brains and, and Homo sapiens? I, I, I have no idea. And I think that there are not many people have got any clear ideas about this because the evidence of, of uh, from the fossils is is so um, sparse and uh, uh, bits of it here, there, and ever everywhere throughout the time. What we know is that a chimpanzee has got about um, a cranial capacity of about 340 CTs. And we would have started off at that sort of size, around about some five to seven million years ago, which is when the geneticists say we separated from the great apes. We're only one and a half percent. Our genome is only one and a half percent different from the chimpanzee still. Yet we have this huge brain. and They have, uh, still have only this very small brain. So something happened between separation and and uh, and today. And it, it's difficult to say exactly when anything happened, because it's quite clear that there were probably many different types of, if you like, precursors to Homo sapiens, um, some in the land and some in the sea and some in the rivers and some of the uh, around the lakes, so you name it, some some maybe in the mountain floor, I know. Uh, so there were, however, there is one overriding factor, and that is that we could not have achieved the brain size we have without access to the marine food web. And it, that applies to the freshwater food web as well, uh, because although not as as plentiful and as rich as the marine food web is, nonetheless, it does contribute or would have contributed to to the um, needs of the brain. And <clears throat> when it all happened, it's, it's very difficult because, as I say, the fossil evidence is so sparse and so much time between different things. However, um, when we get to <clears throat> Herschel, um, <clears throat> about 1,600 to um, 200,000 years ago, uh, the, the, the brain mm. capacity had reached 1.45 cc's. That's pretty big. <clears throat> and um, and for a long time, that's about all I knew about it, but it was enough to, to really raise concerns about what's going on today. Um, but then <clears throat> uh, there's data from a Cro-Magnon and the data from 28,000 to 32,000 years ago. And this data ranges from 1,500 to 1,700. That's the size of the dolphin's brain. And um, so this one, that, that was the peak. We've got nothing bigger than that. And that was 28,000 to 32,000 years ago. So... <clears throat> The modern brain capacity is only 1,336 cc's. So something has happened between that fairly recent time scale in in geological time scales and today that has started to shrink our brains, which is a considerable concern. And it's almost certainly to do with our failure to maintain this link with the marine food web. The Cro-Magnons, to be specific, they were a Neanderthal, Homo Neanderthal um, population. Is that correct? No, I, I think Cro-Magnons were the. Um, the uh, so it's not so long ago that Cro-Magnon walked out of you know, North Africa into Europe with his ladies with necklaces of made from seashells and things like that. It was sort of a direct precursor of. Homosexual. Okay, so my, my mistake. So um, how does the Neanderthal fit into this picture? Because they, I believe they did have a, a larger cranial a brain size than, than we yes. did as Homo sapiens. So does that mean they were equally um, equally active on the lake shores and seashores in terms of um, harvesting seafood to to get to this cranial capacity? No, I, 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 I mean, that's, this is a, 
uh, an interesting question because, in fact, it's become apparent recently that, that the um, Neanderthals were actually, in one place, there's evidence of them eating mussels and all sorts of stuff like that. And where they had <clears throat> access to um, the marine food web and to the rivers and lakes and things like that, they certainly used it. However, there's something different about the uh, Neanderthals, and I'm not terribly sure that uh, there's any kind of consensus about this. But if you look at the cro skulls of cro if you look at the skull of um, Hydrobogensis, for example, it has a, a, a it doesn't have a high forehead. It has a sort of a, almost a lion's shape head. It's got a flat forehead. So that suggests to me that they didn't have much frontal cortex. And I don't know the reason for that, whether it was a genetic reason or whether it was the food web that they had chosen. Heidelbergensis, I'm not quite sure where the name comes from, but Heidelberg is not close to the sea, that's for sure. And um, it may be that they they had uh, they had solved a certain extent of, of getting the nutrients for the brain, but not so enough for the the frontal cortex is of course extreme, one of the areas of the brain which is extremely rich in DHA. So it may be they had a limit to what they were getting from whatever food web that they enjoyed that wasn't sufficient to um, completely get the DHA rich parts of the brain sufficiently grown the way that Homo sapiens did. Yeah, very, very interesting. And the, pre the frontal cortexes obviously are where we allow it, allow, gave us our um, higher order cognitive processing, our personality, executive functioning, all the things yeah. that make us human. So it, it, that's a fascinating to know that, that those are uniquely enriched in DHA. So, so paint a picture for us and um, in terms of what this could have looked like, because I know that in many of your papers, you've, you've described a setting which shows women prior to their to their pregnancy um, and during their gestation, um, es essentially harvesting perhaps mussels or seashells, and 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 you contrast this against the the meager um, access or the meager source of DHA that they might have gotten from a harvested uh, you know ruminant animal that's been hunted. Well, I I, I mean I think that you know there's been a huge um, antagonism towards this idea that we. Uh, I don't understand the antagonism towards the idea that we actually were associated with the marine food web. I, I just don't understand it. It's a sort of macho image of the uh, um, the killer ape kind of stuff, you know, so while we're running around the, the uh, savannas of Africa with spears and um, killing big mammoths and so on and so forth. This, this seems to have captivated the imagination of certain people. And they go on about the Savannah hypothesis, which Philip Tobias, probably the greatest paleoanthropologist that's ever lived, um, <clears throat> said uh, at, at a conference we went to, and, and, and he said, you know, we throw the Savannah hypothesis out of the window. He, he'd come around after years and years of, of writing about the Savannah hypothesis. He said, we throw it out the window. And he wrote in in um, a paper uh, uh, in South Africa out, out there, he said about this, this idea of the Savannah origins that we were profoundly and unutterably wrong. Those were his words. So I, I, I don't understand the antagonism. And it cropped up with David Attenborough when he had a, um, a, 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 a two-part session on the BBC sound with uh, Elaine Morgan, who had written about the importance of the link between the marine food, the marine environment, and and um, our early history. And this came from it, it's 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 it, the antagonism was just palpable when you listen to people talking about. How terrible Blaine Morgan was, and of course, she and other other people who, who, who wrote about this were, were, I'm sure, correct that there was a time when we were um, involved very closely with the marine environment. Of course, if the men went about, you know, macho killing big animals and so on, so that's fine. They're, they're going to do it if they're successful. But the important person is the woman, 
And while they were away doing all these things, the, the women could be wandering around the coastline, harvesting, as you say, the mussels, the um, oysters, uh, and fish caught in pools, uh, rocky pools, and so on and so forth, and, the, and with their children as well. And they wouldn't have to bother whether the men caught a, 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 a buffalo or whatever. It would, wouldn't make any difference as far as they were concerned. There was so much food. It's, it's almost unbelievable how rich the coastal resources would have been at that time when they had been unexploited by um, modern humans. Um, I mean, even in modern times, you know, New York was once the capital city for oysters. <laughs> Hardly that nowadays. So um, I think this is, it's, it's, it's during pregnancy that the brain is formed. 70% of the brain cells survive during fetal development. Then you have perhaps one, two years of breastfeeding, and breast milk contains unparalleled battery of nutrients that are important for the development postnatally of the immune system, uh, of the vascular system, uh, and, and uh, particularly of, of the brain, finishing the brain Going, it's going from 340 grams to about a kilogram in a couple of years or less. And a lot of that is to do with connectivity. And breastfeeding is so terribly important under these circumstances and would, of course, have been, been practiced for perhaps two or three years after, after the birth. Uh, but the, the mothers themselves would have been having availability to, uh, of, of the most phenomenal rich food resource obtainable with very little energy. Now, another point about this is that it's not just because X and oic acid, not just omega-3 DHA, it's also the trace elements which you get in this marine food web. Because iodine deficiency for a star is the commonest cause of mental retardation and cretinism. And that is iodine deficiency. And iodine goes along with, with uh, copper, zinc, manganese, selenium, and iron, which are all in the, particularly the um, shellfish, they're particularly rich in these trace elements. And uh, so they, they, they actually are, are very interesting because they form the prosthetic group of, of, um, of the, the, the enzymes that are responsible for maintaining sensitive parts of the brain. They, they strongly act to soak up any bits of oxygen that are flying about trying to peroxidize the brain. And remember that DHA is highly susceptible to peroxidation, number one. Number two, that the brain uses more oxygen than any other tissue. In the adult, 20% of your energy is going into the brain, which, but it only occupies 2% of the body weight. Um, but the newborn, newborn child, it's as much as 60% of the energy is going into brain growth. So the, the, there's a phenomenal amount of oxygen being thrown around inside the brain, and the brain has to be protected about this. And the trace elements, the selenoproteins, and all the rest of these enzymes are, are, are dedicated to surfacing the, the plasma membrane, the cytosol, the mitochondria, and so on. They're all specific enzymes set there by nature, by herself, to protect against peroxidation. And this is, this is a powerfully important aspect of the marine food web, because in modern times, with intensive um, land use, the trace elements content of, of food has been slipping. Yes, and uh, it, we'll, we'll talk about this later in the discussion, but the thought that women these days are um, eating much, much, much less seafood than these ancestral dictates um, prescribe for our, our species, combined with um, perhaps a more intake of omega-6 polyunsaturated fatty acids, which are very prone to oxidation and lacking any um, uh, intake of, of compounds that might damage, uh, 
quench that uh, lipid peroxidation. You can just imagine that this is a real recipe for uh, a cognitive de-evolution. Um, but I, I definitely want to to get to that topic um, in in a in a roundabout way. The to make it clear to the listener, the Savannah hypothesis was this idea that um, we evolved this higher cognitive function. Um, hunting animals on the savanna and perhaps harvesting bone marrow and harvesting brain to to of of, of but but as you've just pointed out, Michael, it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't um, no. the, the sums don't add up. No, no, and, and so you can listen to David uh, uh, Sir David Attenborough's two part program called "The Scars of Evolution." It's still on the BBC website, and it's a radio program. It's absolutely wonderful to hear the. The, the caustic remarks about Elaine Morgan and about the uh, Sir Alistair Hardy, who started this all off about 1960 when he, he wrote, did, did, did uh, Homo sapiens have, have an aquatic past or something like that? I can't remember the title. But um, uh, there were, you know, there were things like um, uh, saying, well, what, do, what do these people mean? Do they mean putting a toe in the water kind of thing? You know, that's the sort of criticism they were throwing at Elaine Morgan. Nothing scientific. There's no scientific um, criticism. And we've kept on asking people to, to give a science um, uh, uh, critique that, that actually was had some evidence behind it, and there isn't any. And, but the evidence of, of, of uh, significance of, with regard to the brain is overwhelming and it's indisputable. Yes. And and the the macho aspect is definitely something that I think is probably part of it. And we well, would yes. much the, 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 the macho um culture would like to think that we developed as Homo sapiens based on our physical prowess and hunting down large mammals with spears and brute strength. But as you so eloquently put, the reality is much more likely that women and um, pregnant women grazing by the sea or harvesting seafood by the seashore or cracking open a muscle for their, you know, maybe three-year-old son. And um, yeah. that, that is probably how we, we developed our, uh, our amazing cognitive function. I think yeah. you, you've really presented that um, quite clearly. The, the reason why I really want to hammer this point is because in the modern health uh, space and the health narrative, there's a group, the, the carnivore diet group, um, which are promoting an exclusive animal-based um, diet of, of ruminant meat and ruminant fat and sometimes ruminant organs, they are they're really lacking in this understanding of the key role of the marine food web, yeah. and they're they're they're, they're simply um, missing all this information that you've just presented to us. And I think the the nothing illustrates that more than the the lion versus the dolphin analogy that you presented. Yeah, yeah, that's right. The um. So, so pregnancy, we've talked about that and um, we talked about breastfeeding and, and the fact that breast milk is is uniquely enriched in DHA. Do no. you, I, I know in your recent podcast with Cameron Borg, you, you described, um, or it was mentioned that women have a slightly higher ability to convert precursors to yes. uh, DHA. Um, can you talk about any other female specific adaptions? Do do women carry DHA in a specific location, or um, talk talk to about that as much as you can? Thanks. Well, it's difficult actually because um, uh, we, so far as women are concerned, we should have to start thinking about arachidonic acid as well as DHA, and um, DHA is prominent in the brain, and you. There's a, there's a lot of evidence that um, uh, that the marine food web is important. And let me give you just one example. There's a paper by uh, Joe Hib Hibbron and Jean Golding and others in 2007. And in it, they described uh, a study that would be done in the Bristol region, in the Avon region of the UK, on over 14,000 pregnancies. And what they did was to follow up the, um, uh, to, to examine the, the, what happens during the pregnancy and then follow up the children to eight years later. And what they found was that at eight years of age, the cognitive ability, verbal reasoning, Motor function, fine motor function, 
and several behavioral scores, all were superior the more the fish and seafood the mother had eaten during the pregnancy. Now, this is profoundly important because it was more or less a straight line um, uh, with, with regard to the amount of fish and seafood they eaten during the pregnancy. And um, this is the largest and longest cohort study that's pretty well ever been done in this kind of area. And it, 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 it just absolutely nails it that, that, um, that there is this relationship today of in our women of, of, of between the amount of fish and seafood and the mental health of the child eight years later. So there are many other studies that have been done on, in pregnancy to show the importance of individual items. And they, so I, I'm not altogether happy with some of it because, um, as I mentioned, the, um, the marine food web is not just about DHA. There's a whole lot of other micronutrients that are involved in it, and, and in particular, these trace elements, which are so terribly important for the uh, maintenance and health of the brain. So I think that uh, we need to, uh, we don't need to go much further than, than, than the studies that have been done now absolutely cementing the significance of DHA and the marine food web in, in brain growth. And don't forget, we're an island nation, and it was actually built on, uh, on, on the fishing boats, which became rural Britannia. Yes. And can, can you speak to the, evol the migration of Homo sapiens? Because I know in an earlier podcast, you made the comment that it was likely that it, the, the expansion of, of, of humans out of Africa was along the coast and along um, waterways. Is that um, something that you want to comment on? Not especially, because I think it's pretty well uh, uh, certain that that's what happened. And um, uh, Chris Stringer of the British Museum has published a paper to show that some uh, Homo sapiens migrated out of Africa and populated the planet by migrating around the coastlines all the way out to the Far East. And that this was this is evidence was was supported by um, very clever stuff and 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 it's um it's pretty solid that yes. that's that's what happened in fact if you look today at the pop, where pop, where people live 60 percent of, of the global population is very close to water the major cities of the world are, are close to water and um you know the origin of the five languages were all beside rivers and god knows what else so there was a, a whole history it connects us with water that's a very very uh interesting way of thinking about it and and yes that is a very circumstantial almost anthropological or sociological uh reason to favor this uh dha and marine food web hypothesis over the savannah hypothesis and um, the fact that we've got so much developed civilization around waterways and 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 the ocean and um, what about the evolution of upright stance? And I, I want to quickly go back to that because I know that's something you've talked about. And and maybe the this waiting as a as an an uh, was the reason perhaps that we developed an upright stance. Say that again. The 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 hypothesis of of the need to wade in terms of oh yeah oh yeah, yeah. Huh. well it's, so David Attenborough gave, gave another uh, wonderful man. I mean, absolutely splendid. I mean, he <laughs> had a, a, a lovely clip of his from one of his TV shows where he's, he's <clears throat> as his usual way, is uh, with his waders on, standing at the edge of a river, hidden behind bushes and trees and things like that. And he's watching chimpanzees, a family of chimpanzees, wandering from knuckle-walking into the river and um, as they get into the river and start walking down the river, um, they're walking upright, perfectly upright, one, one of them holding a, a baby. And, um, and he whispers to the camera in his wonderful way, saying, you know, and this is the way that uh, our ancestors started to become homo sapiens, took the first steps to become homo sapiens. So, um, uh, it's, of course, this is all disputed by the, um, the, uh, the transfer from knuckle walking to, 
to um, waiting and upright stances disputed by all the antagonists. There are lots of animals that walk on two legs, there's no doubt about it. But um, it's it's a plausible reason to think that, that we actually <clears throat> were wading and swimming to get food. And the Mokans today, this is a group of people way out in the uh, Thailand, coast of Thailand and the Far East, um, who, who live more or less in the water, the more or less uh, fossilized, uh, living fossils of, of that, that origin. And the babies are born in the water. And they they learn to, they, 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 they are weaned by diving down and collecting food from the sea floor. And they learn to walk on the land at about four years of age. So it's a kind of fossilized um, living remains of, of how we used to be at one time in our, our prehistory. So um, it's, it's, it is, it's, it's, it's extraordinary. We, we know for a fact that the babies, healthy babies, are born able to swim and um, learn to walk on the land later. Fascinating. There is some evidence that the role of melanin in our skin and in our hair yeah. could have been an adaption to uh, or a function of excreting heavy metals that could have been accumulating from consuming seafood. And there was suggestion that that was particularly one reason why um, sea dwelling or, or coastal dwelling peoples um, in Asia developed um, you know, quite dark hair. Do you have any comments on that or specifically about the occurrence of of heavy metals in perhaps un uncontaminated wild caught seafood? No, I, I don't accept that the, I, I suspect the, the story of the heavy metals is culpable of some peculiar background of uh, modern days because there's no evidence that some um, seafood in its normal wild state um, poses any neurotoxic effect from heavy metals. Um, if you take, for example, the Japanese, if you take the Japanese ladies, they eat fish and seafood practically every day of the week, sometimes more than twice. Um, and they give, gave birth to the children that have grown up today to have the least major depression. Um, they have the least cardiovascular disease, the least common cancers. And they have the best longevity of industrialized nations. And where's the evidence of any kind of neurotoxicity? The, the, this, this, is, again, the, this story put about by the Food and Drug Administration by the United States um, is, is wrong, but fundamentally flawed. Um, yes, you may get extreme situations where you get industrial pollution causing problems but that's not to say that the basic truth of fish and seafood is positive yes and i recorded uh, an episode with mm -hmm. lily nichols who's a, a prenatal and a dietitian and pregnancy dietitian and she brought up a recent study and they looked at cognitive outcomes out iq outcomes in uh, children who were born of mothers um, stratified by seafood consumption, and there was no level. Um, and they they actually measured uh, mercury um, and other, uh, I believe, mercury and maybe lead. And there right. wasn't um, there was there was no effect on on cognitive outcomes of the kid. There was no upper limit um, of so even though there was some heavy metals detected, um, it had no effect on on the cognitive outcome of the the ch children. Yeah. And there was only benefits for the women eating no. more seafood. No. Well, there's a, an interesting point here that um, uh, <coughs> um, the story of mercury toxicity, of course, comes from, as I think it was Iraq, there was a famine one time, and they flew in sacks of, of um, grains for re restoring the harvest. And because people were starving, so they they ate some of the stuff, well, despite the fact that it had skull and flush bones, because it had, so uh, I think it was mercury to um, on, on the stuff to, um, to 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 keep the fungus off, and there's a huge huge amount of mercury toxicity as a consequence of that. 
And there's a similar kind of um, problem in Japan where uh, heavy metals were uh, uh, pushed into the ocean from some breakdown in a factory. And but these are these these are excessive, hugely excessive circumstances. So they're not anything anywhere remotely relevant to what goes on normally with fish and seafood. Yes, and that 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 is a very important point to make because we can't um, chop our noses off to to spite our face. We can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. We need no. to uh, to rec- to recognize the the immense value this is. And look, we've talked about encephalization. I think we've made a really strong point of how critical this was to human brain development. We've talked about um, IQ and cognitive outcomes in in children and and babies and children. What are the other health benefits? And you maybe you touched a bit on, about psychiatric illness and mental health. What are the other benefits of increasing uh, DHA and these uh, marine based foods? Well, I think there's, there's, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that it's important so far as the cardiovascular system is concerned. And um, I think you'll find this of the American Heart Association recommending that a certain amount of fish and seafood is beneficial so far as the heart is concerned. And people like Philip Philip Coulter will, will remind us that the um, immune system also benefits from it. So there's, um, there's a wide ranging um, health contribution from fish and seafood, not just the brain, um, because the, the heart and the immune system will also benefit. Yes. And uh, I, I think um, that that evidence is very, very strong. And the, the effect of those uh, these uh, omega-3, marine-derived omega-3s on, on clotting and coagulation. And, and really, that's what ischemic heart disease is. And atherosclerosis, it's a, it's a disease of, of, um, of blood clotting and thrombo, a thrombogenic process. So it makes sense that if we're reducing our clotting ability through consuming seafood, then we're going to have benefit mm. benefits on cardiovascular outcomes. Mm. The the one study I actually want to go to to briefly go back to the pregnancy discussion that I really want you to describe was the the effect of DHA deficiency or on the new, neuronal migration in those in rats. I remember that you've 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 talked about that and how timing was so important for adequate and proper um, migration of those neurons. Well, uh, this was a study done by Ephraim Yavin and um, uh, Annette Branch, and, and we we contributed to it later by doing some analysis of what was going on with the lipids. Um, essentially, they fed um, colonies of of, of rats with or without um, the. the, the uh, fish oils and things like that, with and without the omega-3 fatty acids. And what they saw was very significant, was a very delayed neuronal migration in those, uh, uh, the progeny of those that were being fed by mothers who were deficient. And so it was a, a very strong experimental evidence, which um, I think was uh, is, is quite telling. But there are many other experiments that have been done on, on this kind of thing. There is the, the stuff on development of vision and so on and so forth. The Sir Retina Foundation in Dallas and uh, Susan Carlson, Bob Gibson, and, and, and many others have, have studied the... Um, and it goes back to Gene Anderson in, in the first instance, which is interesting because... Here in 1973, about the time that we were looking at the brain size, he, he did a, a beautifully elegant experiment of, of omega-3 deficiency in, in rats. And he showed uh, that not just the... the um, that, that in fact, that there was a very significant reduction in the electrical function of the visual system in a DHA deficiency. And he demonstrated how it was specifically related to the DHA. So I said, and that, that's 1973. Mm-hmm. And it, it's extraordinary how much of the evidence emerged during those early years, both experimental and population and comparative studies, and how it's taken so long for anybody to do anything about it. It's extraordinary. It, it, it's just... just um, been stymied time after time after time. 
Yes. Well, hopefully we're, we're changing that with discussions like this. Do you, I, again, I'm just really tying up that maybe the last thing I'll say about pregnancy is what you've described, um, uh, Michael, is that how critical the timing is and maybe giving your child the DHA age six and realizing, oh, hang on, we didn't give them enough. Um, it's just not going to be the same like as as having an adequate DHA stores, a favorable omega-3 to 6 ratio prior to conception, during gestation, and during right. breastfeeding. I think that point needs to be really hammered home because um, yes. you know, we, we, women, you've got a very small window to irreversibly affect the trajectory of yes. your child's cognitive and visual function. And you can affect it either positively by eating regular amounts of seafood, mussels, oysters, fish, and squid, or octopus, etc. Or you can consume industrially refined seed oils, uh, no seafood, and but it's going to have an incredibly important effect and that child will not re reach its genetic potential if it goes that that industrial seed oil route. Yes, well, I, I think the, the problem with the modern food web is that <clears throat> the, we've uh, gone down the route of intensified land food production and that does not help with regard to uh, the, what we need for the brain in terms of both trace elements and glucosahexaenoic acid. We're apparently seeing uh, signs of iodine deficiency in, in school children already coming back in the UK, which is very worrying because it's, that's a, mm, uh, a canary in the, in, in the food web of a verbal warning of what's going on and we've we've lost the interest in the marine food web when when, when i was uh, um bringing up my children we would on occasions on sundays take them out for a very special meal to a posh hotel just just for the hell of it and um <clears throat> In, in those days, and we're talking about the 1960s, if you went out for a posh lunch or something like that, so there was a four-course meal. There was a starter, which was never to <laughs> be um, prawns or something like that. Um, and then there was a fish course. And then there was a meat course. And then there was a pudding. So in, in effect, you know, that, that recent time, in, in which uh, the, f the fish and meat course went together. And uh, is, is that all gone, of course? It, it's gone in the mainstream, but but Michael, it's really being brought back. And that's something that I advocate for strongly is is eating for nutrient density and, and both the, okay. from the marine and, and the land-based food webs. And eat, my, my idea of a, of a great meal is is wild caught oysters one dozen and followed by uh, <laughs> a, a, a ribeye steak, which is fully grass fed and regenerative, regeneratively organically raised. That 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 makes me ask you, or you you pique my curiosity about what is your um, dietary consumption habits? What what do you like to eat? Because you're you know obviously incredibly um, up to speed and and um, sharp even uh, in your in advanced years. Well, I don't know about that. I mean, I think I have a spent roof, but um, <clears throat> they are. Uh, well, we eat a lot of fish and seafood. There's no question about that. We probably have fish and seafood about five times a week. Wow. And how, how do you how do you like it? Raw or? Of course we like it. Yes, of course we like it. How, how, do, how do you prepare it? Sorry. Do you, do you prepare it raw or cooked? Well, or? well we, we, we try every week to have one meal of sushimi tuna, which is raw tuna. And um, in fact, we had that last night. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, it, it's, um, we, we love that. I mean, I, I was introduced to it, funny enough, by Japanese uh, in the 1960s. Uh, and um, that was, uh, and I've never, never turned back from that. I mean, we love sushimi tuna. And we always buy enough tuna to have, um, have it as you see me, and then what's left over is put in the deep freeze for another uh, another meal later in the week, but not you see me, we'll be cooked, cooked. 
So we we we, we just you know, we just buy it by you can get it on Amazon delivered to your doorstep, you know, fresh mackerel and fresh um sea bass and so on. And so there's a whole range of it. And and the beautiful thing about it is there's such variety that you can buy for for to have food from the sea. And unfortunately it's become rather more expensive now than it used to be. And, uh, you know, if you go back to the 1900, um, the barmen in the east end of London used to go down to the Thames every morning and fill the buckets with oysters. And they put the oysters in the bar free for people to have with who bought the beer. And in the Museum of London, they've got a notice capturing, you know, oysters free with your beer. And uh, that's all changed. That's all changed. Yeah, it's it's a, in this modern day and age, I see it as an investment. It's something that just needs to be a health investment that needs to be made. And yes, it's expensive. Yes, it costs more, but um, it's so indispensable for yeah. general cognitive health that um, it really um needs to be happened. So it, interesting to hear that you you still enjoying five dishes of seafood a uh, a a week. I think that's a great um prescription for everyone to uh, age <laughs> from a cognitive point of view as well as you have. So well, um, maybe we can end this discussion on the very exciting uh, water-based or sea-based agriculture. I and I don't want to use the word aquaculture because it isn't intensively farmed. Um Describe to 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 me your this idea of seeding or perhaps raising the a, a, a situation or a um, kelp or what a, other kind of sea based crops that could facilitate um, greater grow, growth of of seafoods. Well, um, there's nothing new about it, um, and um, I was invited in uh, 1990 to uh, by the government of Japan to advise them on the forthcoming disaster as they saw it with regards to westernization of their traditional food. <clears throat> and they were worried that it would um, affect uh, the health, the brain health of their children. And so I was supposed to, I gave a lecture to practically every university in Japan and, and then <clears throat> We had a, a meeting at the uh, um, ministry at the end of it, and uh, there was a, a long table full of doctors and professors and all this kind of thing, and the minister sitting at the far end. And after I'd finished talking, I thought the minister had fallen asleep while I was speaking. <laughs> but not a bit of it. When I finished, he said, thank you, Professor Crawford, for um, telling us how important it is for the brains of our children to agriculturalize the oceans. And that's what we're going to do. And they've, they have done it. They have done it. Dr. Takahiro Tanaka of Yokohama is in, in the um, southwest of Japan, east of Japan, rather. Um, he, um, he has developed between two islands uh, a marine farming project where he has you know we have grass pastures for cows and sheep so he has grass pastures for um fish uh he the the the, the, the seafloor had been destroyed by trawlers and you know, and he restored it with marine grasses and he developed the idea i don't think it was he who just developed it. other people had had the idea before but he Develop a very specific idea of tailoring ecologically marine reefs, artificial reefs that he planted on the seabed, which were designed to be consistent with the breeding and behavior patterns of each of the seven different target species that he had for um, the, the development. And, for example, I can't remember which, which species it was, but one of them liked <laughs> being in holes and things like that. So he, so one of the reefs was just full of holes for the, for the fish to sort of pop in and pop out of, as they like to do. Um, and these, 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 um, it's incredible how fast these artificial reefs get closed 
um, I, I made a similar a suggested similar suggestion to the um, government of Oman when I was a, a um, advisor to the research council. <clears throat> And they have now got 340 hectares under artificial reefs. And they sent me um, a video uh, of these artificial reefs two years after they were planted. And they're absolutely clothed in, in a wealth of marine flora and a fish all, wanting about all of them. And this has just happened in two years. So you can do it. In, in, in Japan, uh, Dr. Tanaka's efforts there, he's tri tripled the, the fish production uh, in that area. And it doesn't involve putting any artificial stuff into the fish, apart from what they, they have a breeding program, as, as we do with land-based animals, of course. And, and they, they, they breed lots of little fish and put them in the water. And, of course, they have to use artificial feed for the the breeding program, but apart from from that, there, there's nothing. They're just relying on the ultraviolet and of the sunshine, and they're relying on the natural wealth, natural mineral wealth of of the marine system, which is uh, uh, the richest on the planet. And there you go. It, it's, it's elementary. And we, we we we're an island nation. Don't forget it's in the UK, and we. We should be using our coastal resources. Instead, what we're doing is seeing all our fishing ports becoming denuded, dying, and fishing communities dying, and islands being depopulated, whereas they could all become the source of a new industrial revolution of developing farming in the sea. And it could make us completely independent of, of um, external sources of food if we wanted. It would reverse the decline in mental health. It would help reverse the decline in mental health. And not only that, you've got to think about things like kelp, which you have to grow. Because <clears throat> kelp helps clean the water and deacidify it. And that makes the water good for oysters and mussels, crabs, um, scallops, and all the rest of it. And not only that, the kelp is, can be used for good, and it's mineral rich, iodine rich in particular. And not only that, it can be used as land based fertilizer. And not only that, the kelp soaks up carbon dioxide in the same way that the Amazon forest does. It fixes oxygen, it helps counteract climate change. So we've got nothing to lose. It's a win-win situation all the way. And what we've got to do in the UK is start thinking on the same terms as the Japanese and start doing this in the wonderful, huge uh, uh, seacoast areas that we have unexploited. It's incredibly exciting, um, Michael. I think that not only you in the UK, but uh, us in Australia, um, and basically any country that has yeah. a a, a, prof a large uh, sea seashore, um, ha could benefit from this. And it really is evoking for me the improvements that can happen on the land when um, monocultures and uh, overgrazing is reduced, and things like uh, regenerative grazing and strip grazing that yeah. promotes a, a polyculture of different organisms and and natural that work in in concert with nature. It's just creates such abundance and and it's so amazing to think about how we could restore cheap and plentiful access to the to marine foods with yeah. these type of 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 initiatives and it doesn't need to cost a lot it isn't chemically intensive because you're simply as you've described placing in frameworks or structures uh that simply facilitate the natural growth of all these um kelps and seagrasses and and habitat for, for these fish that could then be sustainably harvested into the into the future. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, uh, it, 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 it has so many benefits, and and it would restore the the dying uh, fishing communities as well into the bargain, which I'm afraid is is very sad to see. Well, it's it's a really for anyone intelligent listening and, and industrious and wanting to have a vision for a project to make uh, the world a better place. I think 
this is is one of those things. I mean, the acuity of the problem and the pressing nature of the this collective cognitive de-evolution that's occurring because we're all um, not eating the amount of seafoods that we need need to to maintain our our uh, species brain size. I mean, that's as as pressing a public health problem as as any, um, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think one's got to look at the growth and obesity, which is phenomenal. And it has to have something to do with the excess energy that's going into the um, uh, modern intensification of land, land food production. And you think about the increase in mental ill health. There was a, um, the Children's Society here in the UK, um, they uh, uh, reported just recently that the um, referrals for mental health of children in children had increased threefold in the last three years. Threefold increase in three years. This is just staggering. The increase in mental ill health and decline in IQ since 1950 is, I think, the most serious issue that's far, far more serious than, than climate change. It has the potential to wipe out humanity. Well, well the the irony the and yes it's i agree completely and and the irony is that the um me, various measures that are being taken to avoid climate change which uh, are being uh, dare i say pushed or encouraged in, involve the reduction in consumption of of animal based foods and the increased consumption of vegetarian and vegan diets are in in this misguided uh, attempt at um, yeah. improving climate change well there's there's much more proximate um, pressing uh, implications of, of that that are um, more immediate uh, that are that I believe yeah but it's so elementary and it's it's so simple and um, would as I say it would create a new industrial revolution with, with uh, solving the most serious problems that we have today this increase in mental health and uh, the um Federation of European Neurosciences um, last March in the Brain Awareness Week said that uh, brain health had now become a, quote, global emergency. Brain health had become a global emergency. We've got to do something about it. It's our children, their children, sort of risk. And, and we are responsible. We're responsible for the world that our children are going to grow up in, and we're responsible for their mental health. And it's about time governments began to realize the significance of this. Yes. Well, um, I couldn't agree more, Michael, and thank you so much for bringing this, these ideas to to my, my understanding and to everyone else's understanding. And I really give you credit for Pretty, pretty um, fundamentally changing my mind about the importance of of these the marine food web, and I really pivoted from thinking that uh, we could be subsisted exclusively on on ruminant animals to really understanding that um, we yeah. need to include um, the the marine food web if we we're, we're going to thrive on it from a cognitive uh, and and psychiatric and neural uh, uh, brain point of view. So um. Thank you for your time. You, do you, is there any final question, uh, any final thoughts or points that you'd like to make to the audience before we wrap up? Well, well only one thing, and that is that how much I've enjoyed my many visits to Australia. And, and of course, Australia is all, mostly all coastal living. And you have a lot of people who are interested in this sort of idea of doing things in Australia. And... Um, and and I, I really sort of warm to the idea of Australia being uh, a country that's uh, innovative and could well begin to help lead in this direction to the saviour of humanity. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, well, uh, I know you've talked to Cameron Borg. Uh, Cameron and I are in touch. Um, he's a he's a great um, he's a great guy doing similar similarly good work. So we'll put our heads together and we'll see what we can uh, come up with. Great. Right. Absolutely All wonderful. Right. Have a great Thank day, so Michael. Much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah.